Um, this is a plot of the particle accelerators and their maximum energies over the years. And we're comparing on red our hadrons. So these are proton, anti-proton type machines. These are electron um, positron machines. And you can see since the 1960s, there's been very few new hadron machines. There was the intersecting storage rings at CERN in the 1970s, which reached this collision energy just over uh, 10 GeV. And then CERN built the first proton-anti-proton -proton collider um, in the late 70s, early 80s, which reached just over 100 GeV in the center of mass. And then the Tevatron um, is here, got to a higher energy just a couple of years later. And then the LHC will come online with even higher, about 1,000 GeV center of mass uh, slightly later. And those are the Hadron Colliders. Um, as far as electron, anti-electron colliders, you see those here. Caesar, we saw earlier, the uh, LHC, or the LEP machine at CERN was here. And someday we hope to build something called the International Linear Collider that will probably be out here, but likely much later in time. Um, so why, why people do proton, anti-protons, or electron, positron? Well, the constituent hadron collision energy is about a tenth of the total hadron beam. You've got to remember that protons are made up of things called quarks. So when you have colliding beams, you're not actually providing colliding protons, anti-protons. You're colliding the three quarks which are inside. With leptons, with, with uh, electrons and positrons, there's nothing inside of them. So you're actually hitting um, the electrons on the electrons. So all the total lepton energy goes into those constituent particles. In the last half century, though, you can see that there's been great growth in the energies and <coughs> the technologies of accelerator-based science. But as the projects have become larger and therefore more expensive and international, it's become somewhat slower, and there really haven't been the big technological breakdowns like we saw um, in the earlier parts of the previous century. But a lot of projects on the books still require a lot of people and a lot of opportunities. So what's the state of accelerator research and development right now? Well, like I said, there's the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Um, it's a proton-proton collider, which is, I should actually say that's almost constructed. Um, 7,000 GeV per particle, so seven times more powerful than the Tevatron, but it's got the protons, so it's got the quarks and the gluons. It's got superconducting magnets. They'll be ready middle of 2008. They're already checking out many of the components. They've, they've uh, cooled down parts of it. Then there's the International Linear Collider. Fermilab is trying to be a big player in this. And it is two electron linux pointing at each other with a collision point here. This is not the scale, but we're talking something 30 kilometers long. So two linux, about 15 kilometers long <coughs> each. Something called uh, damping rings in between, a collision point for two detectors in between, and you would have a proton or an electron and an anti-electron <coughs> accelerator. A large, it's called international because a large international uh, community is already looking at this project. There are groups in Europe, in Asia, and the Americas separately and yet equally looking at the technology needed to build this. It would be an electron-positron collider between 200 and 500 GeV per particle at the end, superconducting radio frequency cavities oscillating at 1.3 gigahertz. Something like this, only with instead of three cells, nine cells, slightly bigger. And imagine tens of thousands of these things bolted together along 30 kilometers. That's what we're talking about all cooled to two degrees above absolute zero. Um, it would be lower energy than the LHC, but because the fundamental particles are electrons, you can't subdivide them, it's got a large energy reach as well, fundamental particle flows. Here's an artist's conception of what the tunnel might look like. You have the accelerator itself here, and then an equipment gallery um, adjacent to it. Let's talk of building a muon collider, the Trino factory. You could use muons, which are point-like, but they're heavier than electrons. That may be a way of uh, extending our physics reach. The thing is, muons decay. They generate neutrinos. So maybe it's good for neutrino studies. Something called the Very Large Hadron Collider, the next proton machine after the LHC. Again, that's going to be even bigger. Much the same, only very big. Okay, we're talking about plasma acceleration, weight field accelerators, and who knows what else possibilities are endless. And that's why we need more people excited about particle accelerators like you to get into the field. 
Family Lab, like I said, is trying to be a, a player in the ILC. Um, just give you next last slide a little bit more about that. We're developing the infrastructure to be a key player and actually try and host the ILC see here in the coming years. We actually have four infrastructure facilities that uh, we have developed here. Uh, there is one called NML. It's in an old fixed target experimental hall located way out to the north um, called the New Muon Lab. We're building a cave to put in some superconducting radio frequency cavities, to put in an ion source, and actually uh, create a mini ILC right here online. Um, this building is, or this facility is under construction right now. We're going to move part of a previous accelerator out here for electrons, and hopefully in the coming years, have a superconducting LIDAC generating electrons for ILC R&D, and also so for some users to do some physics research out there, again, way up to the north. Um, just in the past couple of months, out in the Meson area, another old experimental area, we've uh, brought two areas online, the horizontal test stand, which is where we can test single uh, superconducting radio frequency cavities in a cryostat, cool them down to 2 Kelvin, and then put power into them, see how well they operate. Um, that's one space, and then we have a clean room under construction. These cavities need to be built, built in very clean environments. So you have to have a clean room, people gowned up, particle free, free environment. So in an adjacent building, MP9, we're starting to put these cavities together and training people on how to do it. <coughs> um, in, the, our, in our industrial complex across the street from CDF, we've uh, built something called the vertical test stand, where we can test one of these cavities in the vertical orientation before they get all the extra stuff they needed need to be put on them to be part of a particle accelerator. We can lower them into a, a hole in the ground, power them, and see how they operate. This is a colleague of mine, Joe Ozellis, with one of those 1.3 gigahertz cavities. That's occurring um, in the technical area. Why are those people up in the corner dressed up in bunny suits? This is a clean room, and um, the cavities need to be assembled in a particle-free environment. Nice bunny suits, very uncomfortable. So, why does it have to be particle-free? Very good question. They need to be particle-free because um, the uh, voltages that these things hold off are millions of volts. Um, the design of the ILC is to have something like this a meter long have a gradient of 31 and a half million volts. If you have a little piece of metal sticking out, if you have some dust in here, it's going to create a spark. That spark, since these things, since these things are superconducting, could heat the thing up and make it no longer superconducting. So you need to have perfectly clean, perfectly shiny, perfectly smooth interiors. And of course, human beings have to do that, so that, I hope, explains why we need to have a clean environment. Good question. Um, okay, last last area is something called the A0 photo injector, the third harmonic effort. Um, just across the street from the high rise, we have a, a low energy electron accelerator, <coughs> which could mimic the low energy part of the International Linear Collider. Um, includes one superconducting cavity and then a user facility. And we're also building cavities like this, operating at 3.9 gigahertz. Um, nine cells that we're testing, and this is Fermi Lab's first um, first effort at building superconducting cavities, putting them together, and this will be sent. Four of these cavities will be strung together, put in a vessel that can be cooled down. This will be sent to the Daisy Laboratory in Germany as part of one of their uh, superconducting clinics over there right now. So this is really Fermi Lab's first attempt at proving we've mastered SRF technology. And I should add that this accelerator you see here. This here will be moving in the coming months out to NML to serve as the injector for what you see going on here. 